So good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our catechetical study. We're going to be looking at page 33 in your catechism. By way of review, you remember the catechism has six chief parts. There's a couple challenges I have for you now that we've finished these six chief parts. Uh, challenge number one is to memorize what those chief parts are. Are. For many of you, that'll be review because you once knew it at confirmation. But this is kind of this is kind of the idea. Do you know the small catechism or not? Well, if you don't know the six chief parts, the answer is not. <laughs> so I would I would have you all know the six chief parts. And of course, um, Luther has some very strong words as he always does about the six chief parts and. If you don't, uh, this is the next challenge. So Luther's challenge goes like this, and he puts it quite strongly. Memorize the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. Luther's, Luther's challenge is if you don't have these memorized, you shouldn't be able to come to communion. That's what he says. So, uh, Luther, not me, Luther. Uh, <laughs> says, address your emails to Luther. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is so this is challenge one is memorize the six chief parts. It really doesn't take long, and remember, it kind of makes sense too, so that it's not just rote memorization, but you can actually derive this when you think of the Ten Commandments as God laying before us what He wants us to do. Of course, inevitably we fail, and so that shows us our sin. That leads to his response, the creed, who he is and what he's done for us. Particularly, we're thinking here of the second article where Christ, true man and true God, lays down his life in order to redeem us, poor sinners. And that third article, the Holy Spirit converts us to faith in Christ and sustains that faith in us. So that's the, that's the logic as we transition from the Ten Commandments to the Creed. And then because of who God is and what he's done for us in Christ Jesus and through his Holy Spirit, we have a relationship with him such to where we can cry out and say, our Father. And so there's the third chief part. And then you just think of the gifts God gives. And you can even think of this kind of chronologically in the way you, probably, you, you may have received them or in the economy in which they're received in the church. And that's baptism. That always comes first. And absolution that comes second and then communion holy communion or the sacrament of the altar okay? that, those are your six chief parts so i always try to teach i see a confirman at least one in the back there um, i always try to teach the confirmands as much as possible not really rote memory i mean that's great if you have it it's just the problem is retaining it try to think of it in such a way you can derive it because then it's usually there, more deeply ingrained all right, that's first challenge. Second challenge is uh, get started on the Ten Commandments, not the meanings. That's heavy lifting. And truth be told, for most of us as pastors, that's constantly coming in and out and back in embarrassingly and then fading out and on and on. So the Ten Commandments, no meanings. Um, and then the Creed, no meanings. And the Lord's Prayer, no meanings. All right, there's your challenge. Now, as we wrap up our catechism class, then, having covered the six chief parts, we want to do two extra things. One, in the catechism itself, and the other, uh, not in the catechism itself, but we're going to see some tangents in the catechism. So, this week, we're going to be talking about the table of duties, and next week, we're going to be talking about membership. And what does that mean? Where does it come from biblically? What does it mean to be a member of the church? And why does no one want to be members anymore? So we'll talk about all of that next week. But for this week, the table of duties, if you have your 2017 edition small catechism, you're going to want to open to page 33. And what you're going to see here is, um, it can be summarized in this way. This is the three estates and two kingdoms. Okay. Now, if you want to know more, here in Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, you want to go to the large catechism and you want to go to the fourth commandment. 
here's where Luther really lays out his instruction for adults themselves to take in and learn. And here in uh, commandment number four, which of course, um, honor your father and your mother, we're going to see not only father and mother, but all authority deriving from these offices of father and mother. So father and mother, in fact, is one of the three estates, the estate of the family. And that is actually the supreme authority, the supreme state, and it is in fact also the unit of creation. Now that's going to take us a minute as Americans to wrap our minds around because we think of the unit of creation as the individual. Not so. The unit is the family. If there are individuals, they're not in fact individuals because they're immediately woven into the church. It's kind of an ancient church way of looking at being single is if you're not married to a spouse, that is, you're spending significant portions of your week pleasing (laughs) the person who lives with you, um, then you are in a sense, and until further notice, married to the church. That's where your attention wants to be. So, you know, what, what am I supposed to do as a single? Where do I find meaning in my life? Uh, not holding up in your apartment, um, playing video games all night. That's, and then being too tired to do anything other than go to work and repeat. That's no life. And that's isolating, and that's lonely, and it's wretched, ultimately, as you yourself have experienced. So, get woven into the life of the congregation. All right, so there's, there's really the sort of the, the way of thinking about singles from a historical Christian perspective. And um, of course, there are some, it is a supernatural gift, there are some who are given uh, the gift of celibacy um, outside of marriage. So to you, grab Pauline language, there's no burning with desire And so there's no strong need to get married as a remedy to this burning for desire. So then, none less than St. Paul even says, hey, it's good that you're single. Spend your days in service to your Lord and his church. So that's kind of singleness. And then in the estate of the family, you can think all the way back to Adam and Eve, this is the unit of creation, that, that it is not good for the man to be alone so god creates a helpmate and then the helpmate and the man the two become one flesh and from that and from that alone god brings life into the world so this family is the unit of creation not the individual all right so that's the first and foremost of the three estates Now, in a fallen world, two other estates immediately emerge. We could debate if in a pre-fall world they exist and in what sense they exist, etc. I'm not interested in quasi-philosophical mind games. I'm interested in what is. And that is simply that in a fallen world, two other estates derive from the family. And that's the estate of the state and the estate of the church. Does that make sense? Now, from these three estates, these two latter estates, the one on the left being the estate of the state, and the one on the right being the estate of the church, these are the left-hand and right-hand kingdoms. All right, so three estates, two kingdoms, or two kingdoms, three estates, whichever rolls off your tongue better. Um, That's what we're going to see here in the table of duties. And then as we just go a little deeper into the fourth commandment of the large catechism, these are our texts. Okay, so what do we see going on in America today? Um, Which estate is under the most severe attack, do you think? Family, Family, right, and marriage. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. We can see in our culture powerful forces corrupting government and church. No doubt about it. We can see um, a kind of lawlessness gripping the church, a kind of everyone does what is right in his own eyes. We see even, even what had formerly been a rather stable organization morally in the Roman church 
We see that largely disintegrating from its leadership and it becoming an immoral church and one that promulgates immorality increasingly. And, you know, there's just nothing you can do about it. It's just a fact. The Roman church has a great deal of influence throughout the world. So the church is corrupted by many different things. Government is corrupted by many different things. And this true as you go around the world, different things. I think one thing that our, one way in which our government in, is simply susceptible, being generally capitalistic in nature, we're susceptible to greed. We're susceptible to a state religion wherein we worship mammon and the almighty buck ends up being worshipped by everyone, and all kinds of other um, issues emerge from this, including a kind of you know, pseudo-slavery, where your average American might shake his fist like those Jews in the New Testament say, I've never been a slave to anyone. Really? Ever had a mortgage? Because <laughs> then, yeah, kind of. Um, and there are other pressures as well. But is pervasive and is manifest as the problem of greed is in government. Um, That's not what is actually being used right now to attack the actual structure of families. Now, indeed, you can say there are economic pressures put on families. There's the increasing disappearance of the middle class and and all of that, fine. I'm I'm not going to quibble over that. That's true. But when you look at the way in which the estate of the family has, is being attacked, there is one main source of that attack. And that attack is coming from a left-hand kingdom or governmental standpoint. And here's the difficulty for us to wrap our minds around. Okay? What the government is actually asserting is in fact a religion. It's in fact a religion. So, um, you, can call this, you can call this what you like. There are various titles that fit to various accuracy, degrees of accuracy, whether you want to simply call it progressivism or whether you want to call it neo-Marxism or cultural Marxism or critical theory. Um, again, I'm not here to quibble over the fine distinctions in this class, but to simply present in a general way. The essence of this attack is that all of humanity can be broken down into oppressors and oppressees. And this is very important for us to wrap our minds around. This is the Marxist part of it, by the way. But very important for us to wrap our minds around because as you, as you discuss with people who have been taken in by this religion, and just, just in what ways it's a religion, I'll, I'll elucidate here in a minute to one degree or another. But when you find that people have been taken into this religion, you find that they're not reasonable. You can't reason with them. And that's precisely because in their worldview, it's oppressor and oppressee. And if you're an oppressor and you're reasoning, your reasoning is just a tool of oppression. You see? So it doesn't matter if you have a valid logical point you're making that's null and void by the fact that you are an oppressor. And chiefly those that are identified as oppressors in this religion are Christian white males. So Christians are the worst of the worst. Males are the worst (laughs) of the two. Although arguably in their eyes it would be of the who knows how many. And then um, and then being white of course is uh, is privileged and thus to be white is to be an oppressor. All right. What more can we say about this uh, religion that's being taught by the state? Well, it has its own creation narrative, doesn't it? That life came forth out of death and that death is the mechanism that propels forth life, otherwise known in one way, shape, or form as evolution. This is a creation myth and narrative that has no more backing in science than creation itself does. So you have its own creation narrative. You have its own anthropology emerging. Of course, Christians, our anthropology is we're dead in our trespasses and sins until made alive by God through Christ Jesus. The anthropology of this false religion is that you simply define yourself. 
whatever you want to be, that you are. And anyone who tells you otherwise is oppressing you. It has its own moral code. Formally, it's, as we've been discussing, identifying who the oppressor and the impressed is. By the way, if you fall into different categories, like what if you're a Christian black male, then you get a little more credit because at least you're not white. And this sort of social mathematics is sometimes called intersectionality. All right, so there is a complex moral code here. Formerly oppressor, oppressed. Materially, um, yeah, white Christian men are the worst. And it has its own dogmas and creeds. Love is love. And you've seen the creeds posted in people's lawns. And, and this is, um, you know, the widespread pervasiveness of this in media, in businesses, and then just popularly. This is why this is the preeminent false religion of the state. And that's just simply clear. You don't drive through the neighborhood of the church and see signs where people are saying, mammon is mammon, mammon is great, praise mammon, let's all get rich and oppress the... Um, <laughs> oppress the poor. Uh, that's not the dominant religion. That's there. I'm not going to take anything away from that. And it, by the way, if you want more on this, you should really read the seventh commandment in the large catechism. There, Luther goes after the ruling class, the elites, the so-called uh, biz successful businessmen of the world, who in fact he knows already what we all are slowly finding out. They're all crooks. They're all thieves. Uh, they're all um, ripe for judgment. Okay. But again, the dominant, the dominant culture, the dominant dogma, love is love and similar creedal statements, are simply ubiquitous. They're in virtually every neighborhood. You can find these signs and flags. It has its own sacraments, probably the least of which, uh, in terms of like any kind of controversy or discrepancy, is the sacrament of abortion. Um, this has been pointed out, uh, I first came across it in Peter Kraft, a Roman Catholic apologist, um, as close as we're going to get in our generation to C.S. Lewis, uh, out of uh, Boston College, and he compares um, abortion uh, to, the, to the, it's the anti-sacrament, it's the sacrament of the antichrist. Um, you can remember from a sermon I recently preached how it is that the, uh, the devil is stung in his pride by this idea that God would put him in fear of pregnant women. And ever since, he's waged war on pregnant women. And you can see how, you know, whereas, how does this con contrast with, our, with the Christian sacrament? Christ says, my body for you, my body given that you may have life. And how does abortion work? My body, my choice, my body taken away from you that you might have death. So you can see an antithesis there. Um, statistics are really problematic in this area, but some statistics show that as many as 30 or 40 percent of Christian women have had an abortion. So um, there, are, there are heavy consciences even as we speak about these things. And so I want to remind everyone that Christ died for that sin, for every sin, for sins against every commandment. He is not a savior of fake sins or light sins only. He is a savior of all sins, the most serious sins. And in fact, if you look at the patriarchs and matriarchs of the scripture, they're filled with such things as murders and adulteries and thefts and on and on. Even still, God extends his gracious hand toward them. And so that, let that central message of Christianity not be la lost, that there is forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. There is also healing in Christ Jesus. Um, the, the other sacrament is, uh, to correspond with baptism, is a little more controversial in terms of diagnosis. But I'll simply share with you my pastoral opinion, and that's all it is. There's no thus saith the Lord on this, so take it or leave it. Um, but as St. Paul would say, I think I too have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so here it goes. All right, ready to be uh, scandalized? Prepare your rocks, tomatoes, whatever you're feeling like. Um, I think it's woman's suffrage. Here's why. I'm not against women having a vote. That's not a problem. I'm against the byproduct. 
Remember how we began with the three estates and what's at the center of, those, of that estate, the family. And the family is the unit. Now, what you do when you say, or a byproduct of, now the husband will have a vote and the woman will have a vote, you have just very subtly but very poignantly divided the family into individuals. And you've made space for the government to come in and assert, well, since you're individuals, let us dictate to you how it is that you may be divorced or not divorced, what we can do with your children or not do with your children. The family unit is broken by that act. It's one of the reasons why really up until um, women's suffrage got popular in the states um, and then it became popular in the churches, but prior to that it wasn't even in the churches. It's not to say that the woman shouldn't have say, it's that she should have say along with her husband such that the family unit makes a decision and that family unit's decision should be voiced through the man, the head of the household. All right, so what I, what I do is I trace that all the way back to where does the family unit get destroyed and replaced with the individual, and that's where I find it. If you find it somewhere else, understand the spirit with which I'm saying this and why I'm saying this. It's not out of misogyny or anything like this. That's where I see an analogy to baptism, where a new anti-creation is made. No longer the family unit, but the individual unit. Does that mean I think all women should stop voting? No. The cat's out of the bag on that one, so go vote, especially <laughs> on moral issues that we need you to vote on. Okay. So, again, this is a religion complete with its own sacraments. Even if you disagree with me on the particulars, please take a look and see for yourself that it does, in fact, have sacraments. There is excommunication. Anyone know what it is? Cancel culture. Off you go. No longer platformed on Twitter or anywhere else. So excommunication in this religious system. And of course there is a God. Surprising as that may be. Who's the God? Technology is a good question. Yeah, it's, I mean, that, it's worth entertaining, but I think it's just more basic than that. I think technology is um, maybe equivalent to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but who is, the, who is the new God? You. You. Yeah, I mean, that's it. There's, there's science that sort of enables and dogmatizes. There's technology that enables you to believe this. But ultimately, the God is you, you're, and this is, you can just see where this extends from enlightenment, that man is the measure of all things, and it's just brought into its culmination and completeness. And as we see all things, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. What did Adam and Eve desire? To be like gods. And that's precisely what this is, to be like gods. You think you're a male, you're a male, even if you've got female body parts. You think you're a dolphin, maybe you're a dolphin. We all have to respect this. I, you know, this is the kind of insanity of, hey, you're, you're the God of you, and, ev and everyone else in the world has got to bend the knee and use whatever um, pronouns or names required by the individual God. So, from now on, I think my pronoun's going to be like, Almighty. So you can be like, Almighty Rody. Yeah, why not, right? No. <laughs> I mean, this is ridiculous. It's just dumb. All right, so we're, we're assessing this. Now, now, here's where the rug gets pulled on us as Lutherans, maybe in particular, but I think as Christians. For approximately 60 years, we've had terrible theology, catechesis, and preaching. And we have basically assumed that the American definition of a separation between church and state is biblical and Christian. Spoiler alert. It's not. It's not even remotely close to a biblical understanding. Luther, for example, in the fourth commandment of the large catechism has this to say. Civil government has two jobs. To rule according to the natural law. That is according to God's own law and will. That's number one. Number two, to protect the church for the salvation of as many souls as possible. 
This is given to us in the Lutheran confessions as the criteria by which we Lutheran Christians are to evaluate all government. Are you ruling according to the natural law? Are you ruling in such a way that you protect the church so that she can thrive? Right? That's it. And we are, as Christians, placed in a position of judgment over the government. Now, it just so happens to be the case that that's true all the more for a democratic republic. That we ourselves as voters are already in the left-hand kingdom put into those places. So you need to assess, in the left-hand setup, you need to assess your rulers that you have elected. Are they governing according to the documents that rule our country? Are they governing according to the Constitution and Bill of Rights and the laws on the books insofar as they follow natural law? And if not, out they go. That's your duty in the left-hand kingdom, spelled out in a democracy. Okay? And then as Christians, all the more are we given to judge rulers by whether or not they're faithful to God. Okay? So what have we done instead? This is the message that's come down. Separation of church and state. Everything the state says is de facto political. Thus, since there's a separation, the church can make no statement on things political. The church needs to mind its own business, preach Jesus, and never say anything about politics. So it is perceived in Christianity as a limiting factor on churches, which constitutionally is flip-flopped. It's actually a limiting factor on government constitutionally. Okay? Government shall not infringe upon churches. Okay? Now, that aside, theologically speaking, this is utter nonsense. In fact, you might remember in Revelation chapter 13, do you remember the great dragon and his evil trinity? The beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. If you remember from our class, these two beasts, the beast of the sea, uh, of the sea is the first beast, and this is government gone awry. This is government tyrannical and not governing according to the natural law and doing whatever it may to stymie, inhibit, or persecute the church. That's the beast of the state. That's John himself speaking against the beast of the state. So the idea that the state um, can, cannot be confronted by the church is simply not a biblical idea. That is our job and a job we have abdicated for far too long. But many of the people sitting in our pews have bought into this idea that a pastor or a church cannot speak to anything the state says because they're de facto political. But what if the state is actually putting forward its own false religion? Then can, this, can the church not say, <clears throat> Christian people, don't be misled by this religion, by this false religion of the beast. And that is precisely where we've abdicated our duty such that so many of our young people unwittingly go out into the world with a naive idea of church and the separation of church and state as if this were the two kingdoms doctrine or something. And they say, well, I'm a Christian, so I can vote however I want in the state as long as the state won't touch my Christianity. And so through this sophistry, you have young people voting pro-abortion, pro-LGBT, pro the very things that will end up crushing the church under persecution. It's a kind of insanity we've fallen into. But I hear this insanity all the time, quite personally. I've heard, stop being political, get back in your lane, only preach Jesus, submit to the state, stop being so angry and hateful. And indeed, I've seen Christians leave this congregation because I've dared to speak against the religion of the beast. So, what good does it do us to sit and watch as the religion of the beast devours our young people? And as I, I, 
Woe to me if I as a pastor simply uh, send our people out as and our children out as sheep to the slaughter. This is all political. Don't worry about buy into all of it. Five years from now, you're not only are you not a Christian, you're converted in antagonism to the Christian church. And that's what we're seeing in spades. So God has, in fact, called us then to wage war against the two beasts, the other one, of course, the beast of the earth, uh, no less dangerous. But we would describe that as the abuse, if, there's, if the abuse, if the, excuse me, the beast coming from the sea is political tyranny or a perversion of the left-hand kingdom, what's the beast coming from the earth? Religious tyranny and pollution or a perversion of the right-hand kingdom. Okay? So these are, the, these are the beasts that our families are facing down and that the Christian church is facing down. Now, how do we overcome these beasts and the dragon in the center? By the blood of Jesus and by bearing witness to him. That's it. By the blood of the Lamb, and by the witness of our mouths. That's all we have. Okay? So that's sufficient. And in these things is the victory. But let us be bold then in the blood of the Lamb and with the word of testimony and with the knowledge of God and go forth and confront these things without fear. That's what we need to do. And in confronting them, we're going to find people who have been broken and destroyed and smashed to oblivion by the beast. And they're going to see that we're different. And they're going to say... Is there any hope for me? And we're going to say, come be baptized with a water that washes you thoroughly of every last sin. A water in which there is healing deeper than you can now imagine. A water which will not only wash over you, but well up within you unto eternal life. And that water is the water of holy baptism. Poured out on each one of us poor miserable sinners just like you by our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the appeal of the church. What do we need to do then? Well, we want to fight in as many ways as we can, but here's the most deadly way in which we can fight to reorganize and reprinciple our family units. That's the order of creation. It begins so foundationally as that the heads of the households would themselves and insofar as they're able with their family unit reinstate the prayer of the catechism the prayer of ancient christianity the prayer of ancient old testament scripture and god's people from the very beginning it begins by making the sign of the cross and praying at minimum the lord's prayer every morning on to the meal prayers on to the prayer at the close of the day we need to wage war with prayer uh, just one example, do you remember when the disciples could not cast out the demon from that man's son? And Jesus comes and does it, and then they say, well, Lord, why could we not have cast it out? And he doesn't say, well, because you're not me. He says, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. And too long have these been neglected or seen as optional or impotent. These are our tools. More on fasting later, but let's lay the groundwork first, and that's prayer. And then we can, we can begin in just a simple and easy way with fasting. Um, if, if you want me to sort of cut to the chase, easy way of getting into prayer, just cut it down to sign of the cross, Lord's Prayer, meal prayer, same thing at the end of the day. Grow from there. Let's humble ourselves and be weak, and then let God be strong in that weakness. Um, really simple way to begin a, a historic way of fasting. Uh, so... Typical Christian days of fasting are Wednesdays and Fridays. Just skip lunch. Okay? Eat breakfast, skip lunch, eat dinner. Um, with those meals on that day, stop before you're completely full. That's it. That's a good introduction. Now, if you've got health issues or whatever and you can't do that, okay, no problem. And again, this isn't a law. Do you need to do this to be saved? No. Do you need to do this to have a good conscience? No. Do you need to do this or Pastor Rody will look down his nose at you? No. Okay. But it is, it is interesting, isn't it, that Jesus says, when you pray, when you fast, when you give alms, where did, where did the fasting get lost? So we want to bring this back 
And there's even a statement, and I, the fathers talk this way. If you don't like the fathers, that's fine. I don't know what I can do for you then. You're, not gonna, <laughs> you're probably not going to like me. Um, but the fathers say you can't pray without fasting or fast without praying. And I, I become increasingly convinced, not out of some thus saith the Lord, but just out of the experience of all Christians of all times and places, that we struggle so much with our prayer life because we're not even coming close to fasting. We're not even attempting. You, we're seeing no connection between the various aspects of our spiritual lives and our flesh. Like as if I can give my flesh everything it possibly wants to eat and drink and do. My flesh wants phone 12 hours a day. My flesh wants way too much food, pile it in. My flesh wants to drink, drink every night. My flesh wants to stay up all night, stay up all night. My flesh wants to limp through work limp. We give our flesh rain in all these ways and then we say, hey, why don't you pray? And the flesh is like, I don't think so. Why don't I sleep? Why don't I eat? Why don't I check my email? Why don't I do anything else? So to start seeing this holistically as an attack and an assault on the flesh, even if it's very small and humble at first, it just says, no, not this meal, not today. You're not in control. That's what the fathers are getting at when they show us the connection between prayer and fasting. It's a matter of starting to deny and rule over the flesh such that then when it's time to pray, the flesh, its voice and gluttonous being is much less forceful. So this is the war we're given to wage. Luther, by the way, in the small catechism mentions fasting as a preparation for uh, Sunday communion. And he says this is a fine, that is a wonderful and good Christian practice. So if you want to just get started in fasting, as I said, skip lunch on um, Wednesday and Friday. This is really easy to do. It's a piece of cake. There's other more stringent, more historical practices, whatever. It's an easy introduction. And then um, a, an alternative fast or one you could add to it if you wanted would simply be after your evening meal on Saturday, just don't eat until you go to Holy Communion. Now, if you're coming to the 1230 service, maybe not. You know, grab something. <laughs> um, if you're coming to the 1030 service and you know that either like diabetes or just getting hangry, it's not going to work for you, or you're likely to have road rage, then, you know, don't do that, right? Um, keep the main thing the main thing. These things are meant for us. We're not meant for them. So we want to rediscover family piety and family structure. And I know uh, for many of you, maybe this is preaching to the choir, and so just know I commend you in that. Um, but for those of us, maybe my generation and younger, this largely has not been taught. This is largely a rediscovery. And um, something that's so essential, we see it in the small catechism. All right, the next thing we want to do from there is really understand what God gives to us in vocation. Now, vocation gets used in America like in a, almost a pejorative way, especially those of us who are like white collar or maybe even black collar. But the idea is that if you go to vocational school, you're doing something less than you know getting an education, this kind of thing. Okay, by vocation, what we actually mean is vocatio, which is a holy calling of God. Okay, now God doesn't. The holy calling of God isn't so specific as to say you have to be a architect or you have to be a lawyer, or you have to be a plumber. That's a misunderstanding of vocatio. That's more like American vocation. Vocatio puts you into six roles, potentially. Okay? The first role you're born into, you're a child. Okay? And this child or you are then, so I'll try, to, I'll try to go in chronological order, not necessarily catechetical order. So you're a child, there's vocation number one, okay. Now if you get married, you become a husband or a wife. You become a spouse, there's vocation number two. In the one flesh union, God brings children, you become a parent. There's uh, vocation number three. Okay, actually, you know, husband and wife, I think we count as, we count as two separate vocations because they're so different. Um, and then, last but not least, you are either a employer or an employee. The language of the catechism, the language of the New Testament is a little more stark and maybe a little more truthful. You're either a master or a slave. Now, I've got no problem being a slave. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. That's what the apostles were. We're all slaves of Jesus Christ. 
Um, Whoever would be greatest among you must be the slave of all. That's what our Lord says. So there's no shame in being a slave. By the way, what does God do with slaves? Ultimately causes us to reign with him. So if we won't be humbled with him, how could we expect to be exalted with him? So this life is one about of servitude and being a slave. So a slave and a master. All right, let me try to rehash these then, um, just in a way that makes sense. I'll go backwards. You've got slave and master. Okay? Then you've got uh, husband and wife. And then you've got parents and child. Those are the six vocations. Okay? Um, now, that's at the heart of your family life, the state of the family. You can expand that out and say, well, I'm a member of the church, so I'm a preacher or a hearer. You can expand that out into the, the left-hand kingdom and say, I'm a citizen or a ruler. Okay, And those are other God-given vocations. And then there are some catch-alls that we can see. But when we look at the table of duties on page 33, that's the structure that the catechism is giving us. And what I'm trying to impart to you is that this is a structure through which you begin to see reality. and You begin to build the family and build a a familial reality that will inoculate you and your children, God willing, against the religion of the beast. So, What do we see as we look at page 33? We actually begin with the right-hand kingdom, and you see some of the scriptures, not all of them, but some of the scriptures that speak to pastors, bishops, pastors, and preachers. And you have the usual criteria, above reproach, husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. All right, there are other scriptures there listed, but that gives you a sense for the office of bishop, pastor, preacher, all one office in the right-hand kingdom. Now, also in the right-hand kingdom, then there are Hearers, because there's no preacher unless there's hearers. Here, quoting St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So here's a command to uh, give in such a way that you support the preaching of the gospel in your community so that your family can receive this and the families of others can receive it if they're less fortunate especially. All right, Uh, Galatians 6 is very similar in thought, as is 1 Timothy 5.17. Down at Hebrews 13.17, at the very end, this this one I'll highlight because, again, um, we've so given over the jurisdiction of the pastoral office and the right-hand kingdom that we've simply de facto asserted that the state has the only authority. Um, I I experienced this firsthand, of course, um, when, you know, the state says, stop obeying the third commandment. You're not allowed to meet here on Sunday morning. You must forbid Christians from coming to receive the gifts of Christ. It's what the state said. Well, state, is there good cause for this? Not really. We're allowing strip clubs and tattoo parlors and Target to remain open. Okay, so then I say as one holding an office in the right-hand kingdom, I'm sorry those aren't good enough reasons. I'm not going to set aside the third commandment and the gifts of Christ because you tell me to. Now you have a conflict of authority, don't you? Immediately I was told by a number of Christians, you have to bow to the state in everything. There's the problem. So what we also need to do is gather our strength and support the authority of the pastoral office, wherever it may be, to recognize that it's the office that's holy, not the man, 
But if that man is conducting his office in such a way that it's in keeping with the scriptures, we want to rally around and support the authority that God has given him in that place. And sometimes, I mean, scandal of all scandals, God actually requires the pastor in a given place to make a judgment. And that God has, in fact, given him a jurisdiction in which he is to make that judgment and say, based on everything I know right now from God's word and from these circumstances, this is what we're going to do. Not in order to earn salvation, not because failing to do it is a sin, none of those old canards, but just this is what's right, right here, right now. Does that make sense? So check out Hebrews thirteen seventeen. We very much need to get back to this. I know it's not popular because we're Americans. We don't like authority. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you. And this, by the way, is leaders in the church. This isn't anything else. That's why it's under um, what hears, oh, their pastors. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. All right, so then from the right-hand kingdom, we move to the left-hand kingdom. And you'll see here of civil government, Romans 13, which, by the way, as much as it says for us to submit to government, it also lays out um, the kind of government that we must submit to. Namely, one that uh, is... Let me see where the line is. Yes, one that is uh, holding no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Now, was that the case? As they're threatening to sue churches, were they holding terror? Were they were they holding terror for those who do right? They were. What about those who do wrong? No terror to them. At the same time, they were shutting down churches. The streets were on fire. I mean, if you don't remember, Pepperidge Farm remembers, as the kids say. So um, there is uh, there is a sense in which you can see that government was violently subverted. That's no longer the government described by thir- Romans 13. That's no longer a government that, on that point, we owe our allegiance to, you see? So, by the way, this isn't the wit and wisdom of Rhodey. Uh, I would commend to you um, the Magdeburg Confession. You can buy it on Amazon, real cheap. You can see that Lutherans have a history of standing up against this. We have the Lesser Magistrate Doctrine, which we actually used here. If the sheriff himself isn't going to come bust into our churches and arrest us and impose these fines, he's the Lesser Magistrate. We are submissive to his authority. Uh, He, too, recognizes the tyranny that's going on. We also have laid out in that document um, a, a way in which we can all evaluate government, whether government is fulfilling its fourth commandment, duty and vocation of ruling according to the natural law and protecting the church, or whether it's in some stage of uh, lesser fulfillment of that, up to and including being um, completely tyrannical and opposed to Christianity, whereby we are duty-bound to oppose it. Okay, so um, there and there are many things, by the way, seminary professors are writing, fellow pastors are writing. This is an area of our theology, which we all kind of got surprised by that, poof, we didn't have this when we needed it. And when we stuck our necks out on the line, our people were the ones that frequently tried to chop it off. (laughs) So we had better do some teaching and some remembering of our history um, if we're going to survive what comes next. All right. What else do we see here then? Um, civil government and then of citizens. So here are the, here are the mirror image of the right hand kingdom, the left hand kingdom. What government owes us? What citizens owe government? Notice where Romans 13 is. It's always quoted as what citizens owe government. Look where Luther puts it. What government owes citizens? That's the position. So that's the foremost way in which we ought to read it. Um, how so? Because if you, if you know anything about the Bible at all, you know there are countless examples of biblical figures defying tyrannical governments. For crying out loud, what's the crown jewel of the Old Testament? The Exodus! The defying of tyrannical government! Okay, so we show our biblical ignorance if we don't see the entire Bible as one in which God's people are... Con- I mean, for crying out loud, remember Daniel? Why he got thrown... Because Nebuchadnezzar told him, hey, you just can't pray for 30 days. Sound familiar? 
<laughs> just two weeks to stop the spread. Uh, thank you for the suggestion, no. So um, you can see that the whole scripture is oriented towards this. Wherever the beast rises, wherever the tyrannical government stands opposed to God, we must, and to the things of God, we must stand against it. Yes, sir. Correct. But when the emperors surrounded the city, they defended the city. Yeah, those of you familiar with Dietrich Bonhoeffer and that situation will know that there is, within Lutheran theology, within Western theology, an opportunity for violent opposition to a tyrannical government. And that is precisely this. In the same way that, um, okay, Christian husbands sitting at home with your family watching a movie, your front door is kicked in, and here come masked men towards your family with baseball bats? Is it your duty to declare yourself a pacifist and lay down on the floor and say, have at him, just don't hurt me? No, that is not your duty. You, have, you are duty bound to protect the weak under your care, to physically protect them. This, by the way, is Augustine's quote unquote just war theory and much maligned. It is this, that if it is within your power to protect your neighbor who does not have the power to protect themselves, you have a duty to protect them. Otherwise, you're complicit in their murder. That's the fifth commandment. I mean, this is, should be basic, okay? So if a government is, is tyrannical to the point where they are oppressing violently our neighbors and we stand in a position in which we can stop that. I mean, let's, let's just play a hypothetical game. What if our government, for whatever reason, decided it was time to start persecuting Mormons and taking them to camps, or Muslims and taking them to camps? We're not going to allow that. We're going to stand in defiance of that government and stand in defense of our neighbors as best we can. Now, sometimes that's easier said than done. Sometimes the, the old proverbial frog gets boiled uh, long before he can mount any force. And so um, in, many, in many respects, this is an intellectual experiment because it doesn't often bear itself out. But yes, we Christians, as left-hand kingdom citizens, should not be afraid to take up arms in order to defend our neighbors against religious or political tyranny, Okay, especially if it's... I should say maybe exclusively if it's threatening them physically. Does that make sense? All right. These, by the way, these are the teachings of the Western Church. I mean, they've been around forever. It's 1,500 years. Lutherans all just agree with them and accept them. The better of the Reformed do too. Calvin is basically on board with all of this. <laughs> Swingley too, though he's pretty much a nut. Um, so I'm not telling you anything odd here. It may sound odd because for 60 years we've blown it. But that's for 60 years. Everything universally before that is faithful to what I'm telling you. All right, so you see then the table of duties gives us the right-hand kingdom, pastors, and hearers, the left-hand kingdom, government, and citizens. And now what does it give us? The first of the estates, the middle of the estates, and the most important, the family. So on page 35, you see... Um, scriptures addressed to the husband, to the wives, the husband chiefly here in the catechism. And now, the, these are not all the scriptures. Eventually, we're going to do a study on all of this because it's profoundly enlightening. But um, the catechism emphasizes that husbands be considerate, merciful as you live with your wives, treating them with respect. And the wives, for wives, the emphasis is on submission. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. That's how the family unit functions. Okay, and then, so husband and wife, you see those two vocations there. And then you see next, parents and children, those two mirror vocations there. Uh, fathers, do not exasperate your children unless it's hilarious to do so. No, I just... <laughs> Do not exasperate your children unless they started the wrestling match first. Then you have to body slam them on the bed. All right, so instead bring them up in the training instruction of the Lord. Um, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. All right, flip over to 36, and you're going to see a couple other things. You're going to see um, the other two 
vocations that I mentioned that are at the heart and center of everything, and that's um, workers and employers. Okay, so that's the other mirror vocation. And those are really the six core vocations that mirror each other. So this tells us what we need to do, um, obeying our earthly masters. And frankly, everyone has one of these, no matter their profession. I mean, even a pastor has, we're under authority. I can't, I can't do whatever I want. I'm under the authority of the scriptures, the confessions, and ecclesiastical supervisors. So nobody gets out of this. Um, you're, you're, no matter what, you're a worker of one kind or another. And then you may or may not be in a managerial position where you're an employer. Okay, what's here with youth and widows? This is really two different kinds of being single. That's how the, that's how the um, catechism, I know maybe you don't like that, but that's how the catechism is looking at it. Um, that if you're young, you may be single, so this is what you want to do. You want to be submissive to those who are older, humble yourself, etc. And then to widows who may find themselves single, again, you're commended to God. So in both cases, you're commended to God, and that's my point. Like, your vocational substance and meaning in life is not found in frivolous things, but found in God in his church. And then a general to everyone, the commandments given. Okay, so this to me is the most important stuff because it's the most neglected. We've neglected this and we've been in a desert of all of this stuff for a generation or two. So if I've um, botched things, it's due to the fact that I'm a neophyte on all of these things myself and I'm learning as I go. And uh, if you see things that I missed or things that I could say better, please give me that feedback. Understand the spirit in which I'm saying this. I'm only trying to give you what the scriptures and the church have always given and apply that to our particular circumstances. All right, the Lord be with you.